if your parents get divorced and you're four years old, how's that your fault? It can't be your fault. But mm. children do that, don't they? They say it's me, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. And indeed. That, that's one of the big wounds, I think, that a lot of people carry, that <clears throat> sense of it was my fault. It's all my fault. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Welcome, everybody. This is Vasya Sarandopoulou, the head psychologist and founder of Anti-Loneliness. Today, I have invited Dan Roberts. Dan is a psychotherapist, writer, and teacher. He is an advanced accredited schema therapist, trainer, and supervisor, and he specializes in working with complex trauma. But also, he helps people with a wide range of psychological problems at his private practice in North London. He also provides online therapy for people working for people throughout the world, as well as teaching and writing about schema therapy and healing complex trauma. Thank you so much, Dan, for being here. I'm very honored to have you in my channel, also podcast. And I would like us to tell us a few things about yourself, what you do, where do you come from, and where is your practice located, but also what is a typical day of yours? Okay. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here today. Um, so I think, as you said in your introduction, I'm an advanced accredited schema therapist, trainer, supervisor. I'm also currently training in internal family systems therapy. So we'll add that to the mix as well. Um, and I, so my private practice is based in North London. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking to you from my office where currently I'm just Zooming people. I haven't had any humans here for a little while, but hopefully that will change again soon. Um, and this is in North London, a place called East Finchley. So, yeah, just north of the centre of London. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm actually from just down the road from here. So I grew mm -hmm. up in North London. So, yeah, it's funny. I've ended up working like two or three miles from where I was growing up. Yeah. So. Not a big change, yeah? Not a big change. I've lived all over the world and then I've ended up back in London. So, ah, okay. Yeah. No place I'd like home. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. And, and also to mention that Dan is the founder of Heal Your Trauma. So please tell us either now or later about this, this huge project, which is uh, a fantastic help for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, it'd be great to, to mention it and maybe we can keep talking about it as we go. Yeah. I think my idea with Heal Your Trauma really, you know, I've been in private practice for 11 years now. <clears throat> I increasingly have come to specialize in working with complex trauma. I think that was a natural evolution of starting to train in schema therapy, which is a kind of therapy that was created for people struggling with trauma, really. Yes. And although, you know, we could talk about personality disorder diagnoses or complex cases or complex people with complex problems, really what that means to me is somebody who's experienced trauma in their life. Because as we're going to talk about a lot in our, our hour together, trauma just affects us so profoundly in so many different ways and then can make day-to-day -day life really, really difficult for people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've increasingly specialized in working with people with those problems and I'm very passionate about it. I think trauma is a huge problem globally it was huge before the pandemic so i'm afraid now after the pandemic it's even bigger and i don't think we understand it really enough and i don't think we talk about it enough so that was my passion you know was to kind of help all of the people that aren't getting help right now yeah yeah and yeah. there are millions maybe billions of people in the world who've experienced trauma right it's a huge huge problem i know so and and really the idea for the project is you know in this country you have people like me who are not cheap you know that, that are in private practice mm. so obviously that narrows down the the kind of range of people who can see me then you have the national health service which is really struggling right now yeah uh, the mental health provision is very patchy. Yeah. People have to wait a long time. I know. It, you know, it's, it's, yeah. I love the NHS. It's wonderful. Mm 
but it's very underfunded and it's struggling, right? Yeah. So I feel like there's this huge gap in the middle of people who aren't getting any help, really. They can't mm -hmm. afford help. They can't find the right kind of help. So the project is, is a lot about this, what we're doing now about psychoeducation, about teaching people about trauma, about helping people understand what it is and how it impacts them. And then there's an, a newsletter, there's a website. I've just launched healyourtrauma.com. I should mention that. Yeah. Um, I'm starting webinars next month. There'll be workshops, there'll be books, there'll oh, be wow. so many different resources and guided meditations. And, yeah. and the kind of core principle is everything is affordable for everyone. Yeah. Right? Yes. So it's, yeah. it's either free or it's donation based or it's as low cost as I can make it. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so happy, you know, when I meet people like you, that they are driven by their passion to support other people. We we are not oblivious. We see how people are suffering because of trauma. And we are actually now in a generation where people are starting to psychoeducate psycho -educate themselves about what is trauma. We, did, mm -hmm. we were not having these discussions a couple of decades ago. We didn't know all these things. Mm -hmm. So now we start learning. And now, you know, I hear many times people are asking, but I've never been traumatized. I've never had any terrible experience in my life. How can I have trauma? So yeah. we're starting learning what it means. And then sometimes it's not about the physical or, a, or a, an actual event, but it can be an emotional experience that it's really well hidden. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and, and this is already a big step, educating people, helping them understand that what happened to you, to your emotions is already enough to be traumatized. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you get this as well, but I'm always working with people who say <clears throat> it wasn't that bad. Mm. It wasn't that bad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no abuse. I wasn't hit. I wasn't, you know, nothing terrible happened to me. And then the more that we start to work together and we do that lovely detective work of trying mm. to figure out what was your childhood like and what was your family dynamic like. And, you know, schema therapy, we think about this idea of core needs, right? Mm -hmm. the all, core developmental needs that all children have. And when those needs are not met, like the need for safety, yeah. Right. Like the need to be loved and valued as a unique human being, like the need for a secure attachment with your caregivers. When those needs are not met for us, it can be traumatic, yeah. right? It doesn't have to be a, an obvious bad thing that's happening to us. It's this, what I see so much, and I'm sure you do too, is this ongoing day after day after day. It's not quite right. It's not what you need. It's not feeling good for you that yeah. cumulative impact over time is traumatic for kids you know so it is it is, yeah. it is. and the fact that we have reached the point to believe that it is okay or somebody had it worse or um let's pretend we don't feel anything about that that's also part of the trauma all the mm. mechanisms that we have been using actually all these years in order to cope with the trauma, it is part of the trauma as well. Mm, definitely. Yeah. And I think we're also speaking about neglect here, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. About emotional neglect. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and we know from all the research that neglect can be just as damaging for us as trauma, right? Of course. Of course. So, and, and sometimes I say to clients, you know, let's say, for example, a really awful you know, situation, but let's say you have a father who once every three weeks goes and gets drunk and comes back and is violent to you and violent to your mum, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's obviously terrible. And, and we know that that's going to be traumatic for the child, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is only happening like once every three, three weeks or once a month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you have neglect, if you're chronically criticized really harshly or you're made told you're stupid or you're feel unloved unliked you know worthless mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's happening all of the time, yeah. right? Yeah. So in a funny way for me, that's worse yeah. than the once a month traumatic incident. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because it yeah. Yeah. it eats away at your sense of self, doesn't it? Yes, it is. It is. It makes you change the idea you have about yourself. It makes you dismiss your feelings and your emotional needs. Mm. It, it transforms you. Yeah. Absolutely. And we come in this world to enjoy life, but then eventually this is not happening. If we change who who, who we authentically are or we want to be and we suppress all our emotions, thoughts, potential, mm. then we're not fulfilling this, um, yeah, this main purpose absolutely you know and i often use the metaphor with my clients that when we're born we're like little seedlings you know little plants Mm. and plants need certain kinds of nourishment right yeah They, they need sunshine they need water they need soil they need everything to be just right don't they and then they flourish and they turn into beautiful roses or big oak trees or whatever right and babies are the same, right? Yeah. Babies yeah. need certain kind of nourishment and nutrients in order to thrive. And we know that a lot of that is emotional, isn't it? That love, attachment, being cuddled, being held, being sung to, you know? Yeah. These these are the nutrients that kids need. Yeah. And and very sadly, with a lot of my clients, especially the ones with the really tricky histories. They didn't get any of that stuff. They didn't get any of the good stuff, you know? So that's the neglect, right? Is the absence of good, the absence of nourishment. And then the trauma is that, but then it's also as well, maybe the presence of bad things, you Mm -hmm. know, being Mm -hmm. hit, being shouted at, Mm -hmm. all sorts of bad things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 indeed, indeed. I remember I was talking to a teacher a couple of years ago and she said to me, no child ever gets to grow uh, properly or according to their developmental, let's say, stages um, if they're not feeling safe. Mm -hmm. If they're not feeling emotionally safe, um, their physical development, cognitive development, emotional development will be hindered. Mm. In one way or another, they are going to stop growing as fast as they could be growing. Mm. It's right. again the feeling of safety. Such a good point, isn't it? Yeah. And we know that what that means is that their nervous system will be dysregulated, right? We can talk a lot about the nervous system as we go, but just to touch on it. Yeah. When we think about trauma, we think about nervous system dysregulation, you know? So too much sympathetic nervous system activation which is all about fight flight it's about feeling <clears throat> stressed anxious angry agitated up, up mm-hmm. energy and not enough parasympathetic which is feeling safe peaceful calm soothed and mm-hmm. and so of course safety is huge isn't it because as well children are so vulnerable no yeah, yeah, so vulnerable. They have no defenses, really, do they? Until they get older, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes feeling safe for a child, it doesn't need to be something directed to them. Even if their parents, they're having fights or they're getting a divorce, that can also be for them an environment of unsafety. They are trying to figure out uh, how do I belong in here? What do I need to do? Is this something that I caused? Is this is this me that I created that? They're mm. trying to figure it out in their own child brain. Mm. And so sad that we see happening yeah. so often yeah. is the way that they figure it out in their child brain is to say it's me, right? Yeah. It's yeah. my fault. I did something wrong. Yeah. I'm not lovable. I'm too naughty. People don't like me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Because it's not nothing to do with them. And of course, if your parents get divorced and you're four years old, how's that your fault? It can't be your fault. But mm-hmm. children do that, don't they? They say it's me, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. And indeed. That, that's one of the big wounds, I think, that a lot of people carry, that <clears throat> sense of it was my fault. It's all my fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about trauma and uh, psychoeducation, another question that I get very often is that 
people tell me, uh, do I have trauma or complex trauma? What is the difference? Mm. So again, people are thirsty in order to understand clearly what's happening inside them or what has happened to them. Mm. So yeah. what is your uh, perspective on that? What is the, what is the difference? So let's start with the clinical definitions of trauma and then we'll try and expand that out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look in the, the DSM, you'll find two, two main definitions of trauma. One is for single event traumas, mm -hmm. which could be like a mugging, a car crash, an earthquake, an assault, you know, it, any single incident, which is traumatic, meaning to me, your resources are completely overwhelmed. You're unable to cope with what's happening to you. Often it means that it's very frightening and you fear maybe that you might die or that something really terrible might happen. So those single incident traumas can cause PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one thing that's really interesting is the, the, the vast majority of people, even that go through those terrible experiences, don't develop PTSD, hmm. right? Hmm. I mean, the figure ranges, but let's say one in three people oh. okay. going through that kind of experience develop PTSD, right? And the rest is because of resilience or healthy coping mechanisms? So many different factors. I mean, yeah. I would like we flip that and think, why do people develop PTSD? Yeah. yeah, okay. I think very often they have a trauma history already. And then that one thing is like the straw that breaks the camel's back. They don't have the resources to cope with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of research and thinking around about fight flight. Mm -hmm. And that actually, if we are able to fight or flee, we don't develop PTSD. And it's often when people are stuck or trapped, like say, for example, you know, it's a terror incident and then you get trapped in a in a shop and you can't get out or something and you're there and your whole body wants you to run. You can't mm. run. Yeah. That's tricky. And then we go into the freeze, which is the freeze. third choice. Mm. Freeze is tricky for us, you know. Ah, okay. So, okay. Yeah. But if we put it more positively, 70% of people who experience traumatic stress don't develop PTSD. Mm, mm, right mm. okay good news good news yeah <laughs> and, and absolutely that's about resilience it's about coping skills i think it's a lot about the way that we process the trauma we know that it's really helpful to talk a lot about the trauma but interestingly not necessarily to a therapist straight away mm -hmm. there's been a lot of um changes in the way that trauma you know that the survivors of traumas are helped. You know, what used to happen is there was a big trauma, traumatic incident and in come all the psychologists and the counselors and the therapists. And then it's like, let's do therapy straight away. Right. Mm. We actually now think that's a really bad idea. Oh, yeah, because it's better to talk to your friends, your partner, you know, trusted people. And then you should only go for therapy if you need to, right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. We think it can actually be, it can sort of make make the trauma get stuck if you have therapy too soon, mm. right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Good, so, good, very interesting. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, but just to, sorry, just to finish answering your question. <laughs> so what, what's the difference between that and complex trauma, right? So we have a mm -hmm. single incident trauma and then we have complex trauma. Okay complex trauma speaks to is not just one incident you know let's say you grow up in a family where one of your parents is an alcoholic and there are there is anger and fighting and conflict and hitting <coughs> regularly throughout your childhood so that's not just one incident is it that's it's happening again and again and again and again Mm. We could also call that developmental trauma because it can be happening at key developmental stages in childhood. And we just know from common sense, isn't it, that if I'm experiencing things over and over again for years and years, especially when I'm 
vulnerable, when I haven't developed my brain and my emotional resilience yet, it's it's worse for us. It's yeah. generally a lot worse for us. Yeah. Absolutely. And does this mean that complex trauma is happening only during childhood years, or it can mm. also happen to somebody during their adult years? Because, for example, they are in an abusive relationship and it happens again and again and again. Is it also mm. the case? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Complex trauma can happen mm. when you're an adult. But the vast majority of people that I treat the trauma happened when they were children. Okay. Yeah. And again, think about the difference in resources of a three-year-old and a 30-year-old, yeah, right? True. Yeah. <clears throat> when you're 30, hopefully you have friends, you have family, you have a job, you have money. Yeah. You can go get therapy, right? Mm -hmm. You can leave the, the area or the house or, you know, yeah. Yeah. When you're three, not so much. No, right? indeed, indeed. Um, so generally, we're talking with complex trauma about childhood experiences. Yeah. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. And maybe, as you say, um, somebody who's traumatized in, during their adult years, maybe there was already some kind of trauma from the childhood, and then it just triggered what was already there. It was just the cherry on the top. Mm very common to see that mm. and I think very sadly what we can see as well is when people experience relational trauma mm. so the trauma is usually coming from mum or dad or maybe siblings or grandparents you know somebody who's close that's really tricky as well because that can really affect our ability to form relationships yeah. and very sadly it can sometimes make us seek out similar relationships when we get older and this is sometimes why we see people finding these partners again and again and again. And you're like, why are you going for another <laughs> horrible narcissistic person who's being really mean to you? Well, and I think it's because it feels that's what love feels like. Yeah, to them. it feels familiar. It's familiar, right? It's normal. Yeah. So this is one of the patterns that I'm often working really hard to break with people is like, hey, maybe let's not go for another another one of these guys who makes you feel terrible all the time. You know, why don't we try and find someone kind for you? Yeah, 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 yeah. indeed, indeed. And, and sometimes in these cases, anything that is unfamiliar um, sounds or feels as if it's boring or it's too different or weird mm. even. When they find some, some partner who is there, available, stable, protective, comforting, mm. understanding, mm. they feel like, why are you so weird? You know, like, what's wrong with you? You know, don't be so clingy, don't be so nice. Don't be so nice even, eh? Mm. And, and definitely we get that, right? It could be yeah. boring. Yeah. I think, I think I've definitely heard that when we are going through a lot of this sympathetic nervous system activation when you're kids and your adrenal system is really overstimulated, you kind of get used to a lot of adrenaline, right? And a lot of cortisol. And then we can sort of seek out risky, dangerous situations because we're kind of addicted to that yes. burst of adrenaline. And without it, actually, we feel really flat and depressed and low, you know? Oh, fantastic explanation. I loved it. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Mm. This is what happens. It's, it's, it's a combination of body and emotion and, and mind reaction. Mm. 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 Yeah, definitely. Which, mm. yeah, and which I'm always saying to people that hey, it's not your fault. It's just the way that you learn to cope with horrible things when you're a kid. You know. Indeed, indeed. But we're just always looking to break those patterns, aren't we, for people if we can? Yeah. 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 What about this pandemic? How, because you said that we haven't really understood how massive, how big trauma <laughs> this pandemic is. Mm. Why did you say that? Why, how, uh, can you, can you please let me know, tell us more? I think this is where we get into the idea of trauma being a bit, a bit broader than these very narrow clinical def definitions we find in the, in the DSM or the ICD-10, right? So if we think about the pandemic, everybody can see that there's trauma happening right you only need a very minimal understanding of trauma 
to know that, for example, somebody who ends up in the ICU on a ventilator <clears throat> for 30 days who nearly dies, well, that's obviously very traumatic for people, yeah. right? Yeah. And again, we 30% of those people will develop PTSD after that experience. Yeah. yeah. And also because you during this period in the ICU, you're not having your loved people next to you. You're all mm. alone because mm. they're not allowed to, to be there, not even in the hospital, not even in the perimeter. Mm. Right. And, and your wonderful work around loneliness, we know loneliness is very, very damaging for people's mental and physical health, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And And that's because attachments, relationships, connections... Again, going back to that idea of the nourishment and the nutrients mm -hmm. that we need. Human, we're tribal animals, right? We, we, yeah. Yeah, we've, yeah. for millions of years of evolution, we've lived in these little bands out in the wilderness, you know? Yeah. We're wired, our brain is wired for connection, mm -hmm. attachment, relationship, right? So absolutely being on your own in an ICU without enough touch. We know touch is very important yeah. as well. Yeah. So multi-level trauma going on yeah, okay absolutely yeah but that's kind of obvious no you look at the papers you look at the media you're like oh my god that poor person that that's traumatic right yeah yeah you know what i think is more subtle and people are less aware of is the ongoing kind of drip 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 effect of two years of scary headlines of scary videos and pictures and social media, of literally going out of your door and thinking that you could die, right? You could catch a disease which could kill you. I think that is traumatic for us in very subtle ways, which we're not always aware of, right? Yeah. And I always say this to, to people that it's like there's your unconscious is so big and so powerful and there's all this stuff going on which we're completely unaware of, you know? But this ongoing drip, drip, drip of anxiety and stress and threat is traumatic for us in so many different ways, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's both kind of obvious, well, that's clearly traumatic, and then this ongoing hum of trauma yeah. that's happening, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed. And as you say, maybe you're healthy today, but listening to all these people around you getting sick or watching the news, mm. you can't help but think that what if I'm next tomorrow? What, mm. I cannot guarantee that tomorrow things will not change. Mm. And this constant experience of fear, I think, yeah, I agree with you 100%. It's so traumatic. You're, you're, you don't allow yourself to just relax a little bit like feel safe we we mm. don't feel safe in this environment for two years already mm. we're like a little bit tense all the time yeah no? yeah, yeah yeah or a lot tense <laughs> <laughs> you know another thing that's here that I'm, i think about the pandemic is which is kind of unique really is the way that people became a threat to us mm. you know mm. i remember really clearly like at the beginning, there were, there were times when it was really scary and you kind of didn't know all the information, right? And, and we now know that it's very, very difficult to get um, COVID being outside, right? It's yeah. pretty unlikely. Yeah. But at the beginning, we didn't know that. So I remember we in lockdown, we have our walk, right? My wife and I would go for our walk. <clears throat> and just like if there were too many people around, you'd start to feel like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't like this. This is uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so people suddenly are a threat, right? Yeah. yeah now yeah. that's really tricky. And we know that, for example, with things like social anxiety, that's about finding people phobic, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We know that with OCD, that can be a tricky thing for us being around people. So, I think that's another thing that's really messed with our brains, you know, yeah. is this idea that, oh, that person there could give me this horrible disease. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we also had to go through many changes during these two years. We had to change yeah. the way we work. We had to change the way we, this, the time we spend with our partners, with our children, mm. a lot of changes, the, uh, something very, 
uh, common, simple and safe, like going in the shops, for example, mm -hmm. uh, would be something like we would think for, for, for days, like, shall we go shopping or no, better not, or yeah, it's okay. It's going to be fine or better mm -hmm. not. So we have been doubting ourselves and struggling with making even simple daily, daily decisions. I know. And those things suddenly being strange and challenges and, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot about young people um, and the kids that have been through these two years and I really worry about them, mm. you know, mm. I just think, imagine if you were a five-year-old or a six-year-old and suddenly someone's telling you, no, 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 you can't hug grandma anymore, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, we can't, we're not going to see grandma now for like three months, right? It's like, again, we can try and explain it, no, but it, it must be so confusing, mustn't it? And I'm really worried about that generation, especially. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah indeed, it's, it's a kind of deprivation, deprivation of a, of a basic need, the need to mm. hug, to connect, the need to belong, the need to be with my uh, family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, yeah. the, the people who give me nourishment, right? Who make yeah. me feel yeah. safe, like you said earlier, who make me feel happy and that I have worth, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah we, we don't want to be too negative. It's, get, it's all getting yeah. a bit depressing, isn't it? But <laughs> hopefully we're now we're kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Definitely, you know, here we feel like we're getting over this current wave and such a high level of you know in the wealthy countries right it's very different in the poorer countries but yeah. i think in the in the wealthier countries we're at the beginning of the end hopefully now yeah yeah but it's yeah. just important isn't it to recognize hey this has had a massive impact and therapists i think have never been busier i've never been busier than these last two years right? i know I don't know about um, you but yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my team from uh, the beginning of the pandemic until now, it grew with another 10 people. So we are mm. now four psychologists working. And uh, you may say that, you know, it's good for a business to grow, but at the same time, it's growing because somebody else, more people are suffering. So, mm. yeah, not necessarily mm. good news here. No. Yeah. yeah. For me, what I found not traumatic but i was getting really emotional when i was going out and especially during the first year and it was my first encounters with meeting people that they were all wearing masks for me mm. it's important to see the other person's face mm. so all these not trusting each other living under this status of fear that we don't know what's going to happen mm. um, really don't know yet because back then we didn't even have the the, the vaccines uh, living in this insecurity and at the same time meeting each other in the bus at the shops wearing masks it felt like war we are in a war situation and we are in lockdown and we are uh, really suppressed from our basic freedom mm. and we are not able to engage with other people. It felt so, I was so emotional. Actually, I was going in the bus and I was crying. Mm, mm. I know, right? It was just yeah. so strange, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah. I always thought it was like one of those crazy sci-fi movies, you know, that <laughs> it's like, oh, it's actually happening. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been such Indeed. a strange time, hasn't it? Such a strange time, but. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if we kind of try and find the flip it for the positive, you know, is hopefully we've all learned a lot of important lessons, right? Yeah. I feel like I've learned what's important in life. I mean, we now know health. What's more important than your health, yeah. right? Yeah. We understand that life is kind of fragile and miraculous yeah. and we can't take it for granted. We've learned family and friends and the people we love and just having a hug, right? With somebody you love, yeah. <laughs> remember hugs. <laughs> like, so, you know, I think hopefully we've learned some, a lot of stuff about what's important, what, you know, because sometimes I think in our world now we we prioritize the wrong things, right? With all the social media, Instagram, I think our priorities can get a bit skewed about what's important yeah. and what we need. Actually, what we need is pretty simple, isn't it? Sure. And when you don't have it, you realize like, oh, 
okay that's what makes life good you know yeah 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 true oh yeah absolutely i agree mm. so now that we started flipping it around and talking about the positive side um tell me more about the holistic approach in healing trauma mm -hmm. not mm. something that you deal only by uh, cognitive for example treatment or talking only about emotion it's something uh bigger than that it's a holistic approach mm. and also tell me the good news if mm. uh, trauma can be healed let's quickly answer that question and say yes okay, good, <laughs> yes good. this book version yes yeah i think trauma treatment has to be holistic because trauma is a multi-systemic has a multi-systemic impact on us as humans right yeah so you know there was a big change in the trauma therapy field in the 1990s and up until then primarily therapy had been there were different versions of course there was cbt there was psychodynamic there was person-centered but there was it was basically the emphasis was on talking mm. right mm -hmm. and i think what what they realized in the 90s was a just talking about traumatic incidents isn't necessarily a good idea right yeah. it can be re-traumatizing just to talk in a lot of detail about a trauma that's happened to you isn't always the best thing to do. Maybe better to talk, big, you know, big picture about it. Mm -hmm. So this idea that therapy was all about talking, which really we now know is like my prefrontal cortex speaking to your prefrontal cortex, right? Mm -hmm. Rational brain to rational brain is like part of the treatment, but is in no way enough. Yeah because trauma affects our thoughts, our emotions, our brain, our nervous system, our hormonal system. We know that unfortunately, psychological trauma can cause a whole range of physical health problems for us. Yeah. So to me, it's absolutely makes sense that the, if the impact is holistic and multi-systemic, the treatment has to be holistic and multi-systemic, okay. right? yeah so that's one reason for my heal your trauma project again is i'm trying to offer as many resources as possible to people which are guided meditations which are breathing techniques which is using mindfulness self-compassion you know grounding techniques for dissociation information information getting this this is not bad of course this is yeah. crucial yeah um all of that stuff is really important, right? Yeah. But in a trauma therapy, you know, obviously heal your trauma is not therapy. It's, it's, I say it's like everything but the therapy, you know, yeah. <laughs> everything around yeah. the therapy. And yeah. if you have a trauma history, you have to get therapy, in my opinion, as well. Yeah. And so in the 90s, they realized, okay, look, we have to find some more, um, some ways of kind of, in a way, bypassing the prefrontal cortex with the therapy to get into the limbic system because that's where trauma memories live right mm -hmm. if we call them schemas that's where schemas live in ifs we talk a lot about parts well that's where the parts live you know mm. they're not here yeah right? yeah yeah so yeah i think that's part of it and also when i'm working with people i just think holistically i've always thought holistically i'm really interested in people's relationships i'm interested in how much alcohol do they drink? How much sleep do they get? Yeah. What's their diet like? Are they doing exercise? You know? Mm -hmm. So so that's, for me, it should be like a really, as many useful things as we can offer people, the better, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it, it connects all the dots actually this holistic approach because indeed a person who has been traumatized um yes the trauma will affect them in big ways but mm -hmm. also in small ways like uh what do they do the morning that they wake up in the morning do they mm -hmm. you know like get their phone and trying to think and try to see um whether i missed out something whether i'm important whether i'm needed somewhere whether i need to intervene in something immediately the first thing that they do in the morning mm. and 
that can be also related with trauma, being needed, uh, being scared, uh, mm. feeling unsafe. Um, how many times, for example, we skip meals can also be related with trauma because we think mm. we don't need meal, we don't need uh, lunch. It's okay. Let's eat once a day and that will be okay. Uh, all the small habits of self-care mm. that we allow or we don't allow to ourselves can be related with trauma. And, and unfortunately, Vasya, I find that the more trauma someone's experienced, the more difficult it is for them to do that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let's take self-compassion, right? Yeah. We know now, don't we? There's so much research about compassion, about how powerful it is, about how healing it is. We have compassion-focused therapies, a wonderful model. We have Kristin Neff's work on the mindful self-compassion. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, such a, the Buddha calls the compassion uh, uh, like a, so if he kind of called the, the things that are tricky for us, like the poisons of the mind, yeah. he said compassion is the antidote to those poisons, right? Absolutely, yes. I think it's such a powerful way to describe it. So compassion is good. We know this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Compassion for others is good. Compassion for ourselves is even better. Yeah. But if, but we know that for trauma survivors, self-compassion especially is really, really, really hard, right? If we look back to the, it's all my fault thing, mm. if you grow up believing that it's all your fault, it's your fault that you get hit, it's your fault you get shouted at, it's your fault that nobody likes you, right? Mm -hmm. It's very, it's a very small step, isn't it? Into like, I hate myself, I don't like myself, I'm a bad person right yeah and so when we when we as psychologists or psychotherapists say oh we think self-compassion is fantastic and let's give you these self-compassion practices right for a lot of my clients it doesn't work mm -hmm. they hate it they can't do it maybe it's even triggering for them it makes them worse yeah. you know yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think a lot of my work often is about how do we get around those obstacles you know it doesn't mean we shouldn't to help people be self-compassionate because we have to do that mm -hmm. it's just it's not easy right yeah. and so back to your big question of can we heal from trauma well yes i passionately believe yes my whole mm. life is about <laughs> healing people from trauma yeah but with the understanding that it's not easy there's no quick fix yeah it takes a long time <clears throat> there'll be many obstacles you know so yes but it's not easy yeah yeah and it's worth it i mean maybe it takes mm. a lot of work maybe it takes a lifetime for some people as well but it's worth it because mm. the other alternative it's not an option i mean uh, nobody likes to continue living a life you know in in fear or mm. in stress or in self-hate even i know and, uh, I yeah know. And you know, Vasya, it's so sad. Some of my clients like have never had a date in their lives. Yeah. You know, they have no good relationships. Yeah. Maybe they can work, maybe they can't work. You know, maybe they're abusing some kind of substance every day just to get through the day, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's no kind of a life, is it? No, no. Not, not a happy life, right? No. No. So often, in my work with people, especially with the people with more, much more complex problems, sometimes I'm thinking about that basic stuff, like, can I help this person to just go on some dates, you know? Yeah. Can I help them leave this awful job that they hate and is making them miserable and go and work in a better job? Can we get them out of that horrible marriage that's making them miserable? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes for me, that's the biggest win that we can have, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You remind me also of a, of a, a person that I was talking to and she was saying that uh, I start my day feeling guilty already that I'm behind. I should mm. have woken up earlier. I should have done more. I should have been more motivated. I open my eyes and I immediately feel guilty. Mm. So when I ask her, what is it that you like doing in the morning? Is there something that you like, like having a cup of tea, for example, or... I don't know, putting on some music. And she was very surprised, like 
I don't have anything that I like doing in the morning. Mm, mm. I don't have something to look forward in the morning. The only thing I, I think is I, I open my eyes and thinking about work and how I failed already mm. in that just by waking up a little bit early, uh, later. Mm. And then that just colors the whole day, doesn't it? Of if course. you start like that. Of course, right? of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. So good news. Trauma can be healed. If we are yes. thinking that we're too damaged or too wounded or too broken, that's, that's not uh, true. It doesn't matter. We cannot have, we don't have a trauma meter to think if somebody has exceeded this amount, then they cannot be healed. We don't have this. There's no such thing. Anybody can heal. It mm -hmm. takes time, but it's worth it. Mm. I passionately believe that to be true. Yeah. yeah. One yeah. of my kind of mottos in life is it's never too much and it's never too late to heal. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I work with people, and I'm sure you do too, who have had the most horrendous experiences in their childhoods. You know, I don't even want to say what they were, but like very, yeah. very bad yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, on paper, you look at that person and those experiences and then how their life is now. And you kind of think, man, really, can I help this person? You know, can they change? I'm, I'm wondering that, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. But then you go slowly and you go patiently and you, you know, you use all of the knowledge and the wonderful many many different therapy models mm -hmm. we have now mm -hmm. there isn't just one right there mm -hmm. are many trauma informed inform models <clears throat> and and bit by bit slowly slowly they get better yeah. they change yeah suddenly they have a, a little glimmer of hope you know yeah. Yeah. a glimmer of self-compassion a tiny bit calmer day to day and that is, the, for me, is the most rewarding thing I've ever experienced in my life, right? Is to help that person yeah. just to feel a bit better and enjoy their life a bit more, yeah. And, yeah. right? Yeah, and it, it, this little bit better that you say can make a huge difference in their life. Eh? We're talking about night and day. And, mm. uh, and you mentioned about people that they have gone through horrendous experiences and you doubt on whether we can help them. And usually what I'm thinking is that I have also met people that they have gone through horrendous experience and I have seen them um, heal. I mm -hmm. have seen them and I have admired them to my core. Like if this person made it, anybody can make it. Mm, if this absolutely. person healed or they're finding the way to healing, then anybody can do it. And this yeah. is my hope, my connection with my hope. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and of course, when you have those experiences as a therapist, because if you don't have those experiences, it's all theoretical, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's all yeah. like, well, I kind of know that the therapy models teach me that we should be able to do this. <laughs> right? <laughs> but when you when you experience that with people, you know, and I should say that, you know, I had a tricky childhood, right? I'm not going to talk about it too much, but let's just say it wasn't so good. Hmm. I've experienced trauma in my life yeah. and I've had a ton of therapy, by the way. <laughs> and so that's really important for me as well. When I work with people, I always say, look, I'm not sitting here like I'm the therapist and I'm perfect and I'm, yeah. you know, and you have all the problems. I'm like, I get it. I've been there. I've experienced that. And, and I've healed. I've changed. Mm -hmm. I'm so much happier than I was, you know, yeah. Yeah. and I think that can be really powerful for people because it, then suddenly you're two humans in a room, yeah. you know, yeah. you're not like the, I'm the big expert and you're the patient, right? It's like, yeah, that's yeah. very important to me is that we are, we have an equality of relationship. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The human to human, I think connection is, is part of the healing. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, you talked about breathing mm. and meditation, mm -hmm. and I also know that you have your own account in Inside Timer. It's one of mm -hmm. my favorite apps. I like Inside Timer, and I like the fact that I have the 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 feeling of connection eh? because I can see other people meditating at the same time with me. It gives you this image of the globe and people from mm -hmm. all over the world. Uh, meditating 
So it's one of my favorites. And uh, for anybody listening, you can find uh, Dan's account at insighttimer.com, Dan Roberts Therapy. So tell me uh, how breathing and meditation helps in healing trauma. Okay, let's take them as separate things because they're a little bit different. Yes. So, so breathing, I think, is teaching people breathing techniques is always one of the first things that I do. I think when you're doing therapy, you need to help give people tools, coping skills that they can use outside of your office, right? Cool. Yes. Because, of course, people come see us for one hour a week, but then they're out in the world for all of the rest of the time and they need, you know, what do they do if they're triggered, if they're panicking, if they're anxious, they need coping skills right absolutely yes and we know and again this area of breath and breathing and breath works is one of these funny things it's like two and a half thousand years old at least right but in the west we're suddenly like oh breathing seems like a good idea let's <laughs> <laughs> let's learn about that right yeah but, yeah you know like in yoga the pranayama techniques two and a half thousand years old right yeah so <clears throat> Are just really simple things like just slowing down your breathing is always helpful. Mm. Breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth is always helpful. Diaphragmatic breathing, so letting your stomach expand and contract is always helpful, right? Yeah. So it's a quite sim simple stuff, but can be hugely beneficial, I think, especially for things like anxiety, stress feeling upset or triggered the hyper aroused yeah. um, states right the high energy states so I, I am passionate and evangelical about teaching people breathing techniques and by the way using them myself when i'm feeling a bit anxious i use them too you know yes yes um, i'm also using breathing techniques every time i'm about to go in a in a stressful meeting or something that i feel like a, my 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 breath my breathing has changed mm -hmm. i calm myself down as well like it's gonna be okay you're safe breathe normally get in touch with my body before i i go there that's that's helping immensely so so good right and so mm -hmm. simple and so yeah. effective yeah and i always say to people number one it's free like you can just do the stuff anywhere, you know. Yeah. And number two, you can use it anywhere. You can use it on the bus or in a taxi or in a meeting. Nobody knows, right? If you're just breathing a bit more deeply. So yeah, I love the, the techniques for that. So, and then in terms of meditation, different kinds of meditations with different uses and different functions for people. Mm -hmm. I really think everyone needs to have some kind of mindfulness practice yeah. in, in their life. Trauma, no trauma, happy, not happy. Mindfulness is great for everyone, right? Yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about the prefrontal cortex, didn't we? And we know that mindfulness lives here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, again, really good evidence to show that regular mindfulness practice strengthens helpful areas of the brain, builds up neural connections in helpful parts of the brain right yeah and we also know don't we that we need the prefrontal cortex to regulate calm soothe the more emotional <clears throat> more evolutionarily ancient primitive parts of the brain yeah yeah and mindfulness is great for a whole bunch of stuff and i, I don't need to go into that here everyone now knows I think mindfulness is a good yeah. thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Self-compassion practices, although they can be tricky, I think we, they, for some people, they're just great and they're easy, so fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. And then what, what I'd say is if they're tricky, don't just give up, you know, yeah. Yeah. problem solve it. Try something different. Try a book instead of a meditation. Try a podcast instead of, you know, like, it's mm. not just meditation, right? There are many ways that we can soak up these helpful things. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and then there's also, you know, I'm a, a, a big lover of Buddhism and I've spent a lot of time researching and going on retreats. And, and I think that loving kindness meditation is fantastic as well. Meta meditation. Mm. 
which is like self-compassion, but in Buddhism, they're very like particular about all these different positive mental states, right? It's not quite the same. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, Vasya, you know, what I'd say is it's always about what do people like? What do they enjoy? What's the thing that they feel they're going to be able to do regularly? Yeah. And then go with that. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And being forgiving to ourselves if something doesn't work the first time. It, it's mm. okay. It's not our fault that doesn't work. It's just completely new information to our brain. That we don't have software about that yet, but we mm. are creating, we're building this software. So it's Absolutely. okay if it doesn't go perfectly in the beginning. We can be messy. We can create our own style. There's no right or wrong. If we go into right or wrong mindset, that's still the harsh critical mindset that judges us all the time. Mm -hmm. But this time is doing it because we are doing mindfulness in the wrong way or because we're not breathing properly or because we should have done it more, uh, more than 10 minutes, but we're doing it less. There's, it's the same mindset, the inner mm -hmm. critic or the critical harsh voice in our head. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think the funny thing is we can turn all this personal growth stuff into another thing that we have to do, right? Another thing on the to-do list, you know, go <laughs> oh, get the kids to school and get do their homework and get to the office and, and meditate and do yoga. And it's like, yeah, yes. we kind of hopefully want to approach it with a little bit of a different mindset. Exactly, you know? exactly. It's exactly what uh, this, this lady that I was referring to before, she was saying to me, I know I have to wake up and I have to do meditation and I have to do journaling and I have to do yoga and I have to do this. So she was saying all these things that they're beautiful if you have them in your in your daily routine, but if you're doing them because you have to, then mm. they they backfire because they're just another thing in your to-do list and you're not deriving any joy from them. Mm. And and of course, as you were saying, it's never about getting it right or wrong or meditating perfectly, you know. People kind of think they have to be like the Buddha, you know, sitting there completely serene, you know, for like <laughs> eight hours of meditation, right? Like, no, yeah, yeah, no, we just try, we just, just have a go. Yeah, exactly. Having a go is helpful, in my opinion. It doesn't matter Absolutely. really so much what happens. You know? Absolutely. It was an honor to have you here. Uh, I didn't even realize how one hour passed. So, mm. Thank you so much. If you want to say something to close this meeting, like a takeaway message to people hearing and they have learned a, a ton of things with you here, mm. um, what would that be? I think I'm going to go back to this idea that whatever we've been through, however bad it is, however much it's affecting you, <clears throat> however old you are, right? Mm. It's never too late. It's yes. never too late. We have these amazing technologies now, these therapeutic technologies, trauma-focused CBT, compassion-focused therapy, schema therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I could go on and on and on. Many, yeah. many yeah. technologies which can heal, right? And this is science-based, evidence-based. It's not just theoretical. Yeah. So it's never too much. It's never too late. Don't give up hope. You know, there's always an answer. Yes, yes. And definitely working with a therapist who is feeling already hopeful, it's mm. already uh, a good start. Mm. Dan, I'm very happy that I met you, that we had this interview today. For all those listening, please have a look at Dan's uh, project, Heal Your Trauma. Take a look at his website. He has many, many resources there that you can use. And, and yet sometimes we don't have the means to, to afford therapy, but there's so many other ways that we can go about it, that we can get help. We don't need to get all or nothing. Mm -hmm. We can get meditation, we can learn breathing, we can watch videos, we can read articles, and you can find many of these useful resources at Dan's uh, website. Thank mm -hmm. you once again. Thank you, Vasya. It was a real pleasure. Yes, absolutely. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.